Okay. Hello. 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 Uh, my name is Fung Nguyen, uh, one of the fellows here over at USF Medical School. It's on. Yeah. Um, we're going to be talking about Chagas disease today. All right. So here we're talking about uh, what we're going to be talking about today and our objectives. Uh, background epidemiology, the life cycle and transmission, clinical manifestations, immunosuppression and the transplantation um, subgroup, diagnosis, pathology, treatment, and uh, prevention. A little background, uh, Chagas disease, also known as the American trypanosomiasis, named after Dr. Carlos Chagas, who discovered it back in 1909, only found in the Americas, uh, also known as the vector also known for the kissing bug vector. So epi epidemiology-wise, 8 million infected worldwide, about 20,000 deaths per year. Um, about 100,000 of, of the 8 million are actually living in the U.S. On the map to the right, you can see with the dotted line, uh, the dots is where the vectors are found. Um, mostly the southern half of uh, North America up to the southern part of uh, Argentina, Chile. Okay. Um, these vectors in the Americas are usually found in the, the burrows or hollow trees, palm trees, or animal shelters uh, for non-human transmission. However, uh, in rural areas, they like to live in these nooks and crannies of dwellings, especially subpar living situations uh, in where poverty is prevalent. Most of the cases in the U.S. are immigrants who have uh, come to the United States and are chronic carriers. And there are only a handful. You can count on two hands uh, how many are actually been infected in the U.S. Life cycle and transmission. It's a protozoan flagellate that causes American trypanosomiasis. The causative agent is trip, um, the trypanosoma cruzi. Vectors. There's various vectors, and they are the species from the tri triatom triatomine insects otherwise known as the kissing bugs, the reduvid bug, assassin, or cone-nosed bugs, uh, or bloodsuckers. This is some of the, ge the genus uh, and species of, uh, in this group, in this vector. And again, they live in the nooks and crannies of the substandard housing. The reservoirs, many, many mammalian species, uh, zoonotic um, transmission. We happen to be the unfortunate host for these causative agents. Here's a picture of uh, one of the triatomine bugs. Um, they, in the middle, you can actually see the Trypanosoma cruzi, uh, tripomastigote, in a blood smear. Bottom picture is just the uh, first and second stage nymphs, eggs, and the adults. This is a picture form of the life cycle and transmission. Um, Basically, starting at number one here, uh, the triatomine bug takes a blood meal from the human um, and infects the bite site with uh, feces. Uh, these uh, metasic like uh, trypanomastigotes uh, penetrate the cells around that bite site area and they become amastigotes. Right? These amastigotes right here can replicate binary fission. They can also um, reinfect cells around that area, and they can differentiate into the, the um, uh, trypanomastigotes, okay? Once they become the tri uh, trypanomastigotes, they burst out of the cells and become bloodborne. All right, when they're bloodborne, another bug comes by, takes a bite, a blood meal from the human, and is carrying it. Becomes a epimastigotes in the hot midgut, it replicates in the midgut as well, and it becomes the metacyclic trypanomastigote in the hindgut, and the, re the cycle repeats itself. Here we have, just in word form, what I just said. You can read this at your leisure. Okay. Other modes of transmission um, that's pretty important for us as ID physicians are uh, blood transfusions, organ transplants. Uh, congenital mother to uh, child, laboratory accidents. These are when they have um, the vectors in-house and there are accidents. 
Um, there's also ingestion, ingestion of food and drink that's contaminated with the vector feces. And I believe there was an outbreak um, in the South America where there was an ingestion of this contaminated food and drink. Okay, so clinical manifestation, we can divide it into two groups, acute phase and the chronic phase. All right. The acute phase happens right after the, the infection, and it can last for weeks to months. And at this time, you can have parasitemia, and there's less than 1% fatality. Uh, usually it lasts about two to eight weeks. Okay. After this acute phase, there's an indeterminate phase where they are asymptomatic and the par parasitemia is pretty low or none at all. Um, this is usually no clinical significance for us. In the chronic phase, which 20 to 30 percent of the patients um, who are infected uh, um, become, they, this is where the clinical uh, findings are more important for us. In the acute phase, you can get a shigoma. It's a red indurated lesion at the site of infection, inoculation. Um, there's also the Romagna sign, uh, which is a uh, swelling and induration of the conjunctiva or um, uh, soft tissue periorbital region. And there's a picture of that right there. Okay. Uh, acutely, you can also have a very, very severe uh, myocarditis, uh, which you can have conduction abnormalities and LV dysfunction. These conduction abnormalities are pretty severe and causes a lot of the fatalities um, in young adults with Chagas disease. <coughs> Systemic symptoms, you get the fever, the, the malaise, general lymphadenopathy, you can also have some edema of the face and the legs, and uh, they can also have hepatosplenomegaly. All right. um, very rarely you can have a CNS uh, disease. where It's not very common, but it it uh, manifests itself as meningoencephalitis. Uh, with with the CNS involvement, this purports a very, very, very poor prognosis. All right. The 20 to 30 percent of the infected patients actually become chronic, and 10 to 30 percent of the, these patients uh, actually have cardiac manifestations, which is the most common um, manifestation uh, organ in, uh, involved. Okay. Uh, mainly, you get the cardiac um, conduction abnormalities. Uh, cardiomyopathy is very, very uh, common as well. Uh, bilateral ventricular enlargement, usually the right side greater than the left. You have a thinning of the walls. You also have apical aneurysms and mural thrombus, um, which can also uh, cause thromboembolic events. All right. The second organ system would probably be the GI tract. Okay, and this causes a mega esophagus or mega colon. <coughs> Patients with this usually have a dysphagia constipation or abdominal pain. Um, and the third, uh, it's usually rare, usually found in the immunosuppressed patients with uh, full-blown AIDS is the uh, CNS manifestations. Again, a, men a meningoencephalitis, uh, and they also have abscess-like lesions. Okay. So in the immunosuppressed or the transplant patients, reactivation can occur. Uh, it's usually more severe than the typical acute Chagas disease that uh, you get in an immunocompetent patient. It usually manifests as the CNS disease, uh, and at times there are cutaneous lesions as well. All right, this is this is a uh, common finding in the renal and cardiac transplant patients. All right, some patients who have the end stage Chagas di cardiac disease, um, they do have a heart transplantation. Um, they Back when they had higher doses of immunosuppression, they did have a lot of reactivation. Um, but now, when th with the lower levels of immunosuppression, there's less reactivation. And they, the, these heart transplant patients actually do better uh, than the other uh, patients who undergo heart transplantations, mainly because Chagas disease affects their heart, and they're not uh, burdened with the comorbidities of the other heart transplant patients. All right, so diagnosis. Uh, very difficult. Um, you have to have a history that's consistent with exposure to T. cruzi. Uh, you have to come from an endemic area or visit that area. Um, you had to have either had a blood transfusion in that area or organ transplant in that area. Um, you had to have visited like, rural areas. Uh, detection of the parasite uh, in the immunocompetent patient, the acute disease, you can do a thick or thin blood smear, the wet preps, 
and uh, the gem sustain for the blood and buffy coat. Okay, this is usually pretty um, uh, beneficial during the acute phase when parasitemia is pretty high. Detecting the parasites uh, acutely in the immunocompromised patients, you can do um, a lot of tissue aspirates, especially the lymph node and the bone marrow aspirate. Uh, pericardial fluid, you can take a biopsy of the epimyocardium, skin, CSF, etc. Uh, during this phase, during the acute phase, anti-IgM um, is not very useful. They don't recommend it. And there's a picture of the little, uh, the little flagellate right there. So in chronic disease, it's also it's pretty difficult. Again, the parasitemia is pretty low, so they recommend two different positive tests, uh, either serology and IgG. Uh, unfortunately, this can be positive for a very, very long time, for many years, even after you've treated. So it doesn't really tell us whether or not the patient's acutely ill. You can check ELISA, you can check a immunofluorescent assay, immunoblot, and two of these have to be positive. If it's discordant, one's positive, one's not, diagnosis should be pursued at a specialized lab, okay? Or, and also check um, an IgG maybe six months down the line. In the specialized labs for testing, this can take several weeks and can delay our treatment and, uh, for our patients. Um, but you can grow these in blood cultures. You can check a PCR or you can actually have a xenodiagnosis where you infect the, the uh, uh, vectors in a lab and see if it actually grows. Okay. Pathology, I'm just going to glean over this pretty quickly. Um, what you can find uh, is the parasite itself, itself uh, actually in the muscle or subcutaneous tissue. You can actually see the parasitemia and blood smear. And the pseudocyst you can also see <coughs> as the amastigotes, which is, there's a picture of that here on the right. And again, CSF can be seen with the parasite. All right. This kind of tells you that you have a lot of dense fibrosis, you have a lot of chronic inflammatory changes that cause a lot of the clinical manifestations of um, chronic Chagas disease. Um, in the esophagus and the digestive tract, uh, when they have mega disease, you can see that there's um, focal inflammation and lymphocyte infiltration, but you can also see uh, decreased neurons and increased fibrosis in the plexus. So treatment and management, there are two drugs approved, um, nifiridamox uh, and also benznidazole. Okay, these two are actually, for the United States, have to be um, acquired through the CDC. So the nifiridamox uh, is usually taken for 90 to 20 days uh, with the dosage given here. Uh, the dosage increases as the age goes down, but we're talking uh, only about adults for now. Uh, there's a re there's it's been shown in a lot of the studies that it actually reduces the duration and severity of the disease, the illness. It decreases the mortality, and there's a 70% um, cure rate for the parasito uh, parasitology. Okay, severe side effects is mainly GI, um, uh, but the one that we really are concerned about is the neurological, where you could have um, neuropathy and seizures. Benzinidazole, uh, similar efficacy as the the other medication. The side effects are, are a little bit different. They have mostly the rash and granulocytopenia. Okay, and this is where CDC is just the, that's the website that you can go to for information, and also to um, to work up uh, patients as well. So treatment and management. For the cardiac disease and chronic um, Chagas, you can do a, a mo you can monitor the ECG for any kind of um, arrhythmias that you might see, uh, and if you do see any arrhythmias, you can see you can have pacemakers or ICDs, okay, and then you can treat them as far as cardiomyopathy, dilated cardiomyopathy per guidelines. Uh, end stage uh, can be um, referred to heart transplant. So mega esophagus, um, you, we manage these as, a, as an idiopathic achalasia, all right? 
some of these are some of the um, uh, procedures that we can do: balloon dilation, um, surgical uh, intervention, where they do a wide esophagocardiomyectomy and you do a valvoplasty, and uh, or esophagectomy with the esophagastroplasty. Okay. Uh, they're starting to do a little bit more with laparoscopic myotomy, which is less invasive and may yield a little better results. They, there's not much uh, benefit with the botulinum toxin, uh, but it's still offered. Okay, so this is just showing the, the barium swallow with the very, very dilated esophagus. For colon colonic uh, dysfunction, for early, it's usually symptomatic relief. You high fiber diet, laxatives or enemas. At times, you might need manual disimpaction. Okay, this can progress to toxic megacolon, which uh, requires uh, surgical resection. Uh, some of the complications of this chronic disease can also be um, volvulus, uh, which can be treated conservatively, but eventually will need a surgical intervention. All right. So this is just another um, X-ray showing the megacolon. So who should be treated? Uh, these, three, these three groups are especially um, advised to be treated. Infants with congenital Chagas disease who received it from their mom. Um, all persons who have acute Chagas disease. And chronically infected children who are less than 17 years of age or 17 themselves. Um, basically because the, the chronic disease, they have, a better, have, they have a higher chance of having a chronic disease later on in life. Um, there is controversy on when to to treat them for chronic indeterminate or chronic phases. Um, they don't they, since the length of um, treatment is very long, 90 to 120 days versus 60 days, and the side effects are, are somewhat severe. Um, there is question on whether to give these patients any medication. Okay, and for pregnancy, it's unknown whether it's um, harmful or beneficial. So prevention, um, they're starting to do a lot more now. The, there's blood donation screening, all right? Laboratory personnel who are dealing with these, um, these parasites uh, need gloves and eye protection. There should be containment of the lab-produced vectors, especially since um, the accidents have occurred when these vectors have been, um, uh, have escaped. Uh, and then travelers to endemic areas, again, and avoid dilapidated um, dwellings. Um, insect repellent and bed nets. Okay, and that's it. Any questions? Um, question. If you give these if you give transplant patients or a pre transplant that presumes Chagas, would you treat that individual if it hasn't been treated? If they haven't been treated, given that it's, first of all, you're taking away the part, but they may have colonic disease. Yeah. There's no, there's no um, guidelines on whether to treat them or not, um, as far as chronic disease. Uh, but, but there is a risk of having it reactivated. So it might be beneficial to actually treat them before they get the transplant. Hey, Doug, I have a question for you. Um, if we have one locally, do we call the CC directly through the blog, through the CC website, 